Well, the drive behind this report is actually um, a group of physicians being together and seeing that IBS is a big part of clinical practice. We are focusing on IBS and we actually see that others in our uh, profession are focusing less on IBS and that actually overall the care for IBS is perhaps not at the level that it should be. Um, and above that actually, if you look at the regulatory and the society uh, interest in IBS, we also think that they underestimate the importance of the syndrome, the condition and its implication. So we looked at a couple of things. First is we looked at what does it do to patients and it has a dual effect. It causes of course symptoms um, and probably with the symptoms there's worry and loss of quality of life. And for the worry part, uh, the bad thing is that on average patients get communicated a diagnosis on average after four years and a half. This is what the literature analysis shows us. Um, I think this is unbelievably long. Um, this doesn't mean that these patients have not been dealt with, but I think there is a hesitancy with physicians to communicate that type of, of, of diagnosis. We can come back on that later. The second is this has a high impact on quality of life um, and it brings with it some associated costs as well. Um, there are costs at different levels, but there is a own patient cost associated with it that we try to estimate, which is considerable. And then there's societal um, and healthcare costs as well associated to it. So the healthcare part, the cost there is easy. You just look at usage of resources, which means physician visits, uh, procedures, drugs, and actually this is a costly condition. Of course, it is prevalent. Uh, many people go to see a physician. It is of a chronic recurrent nature, so it, you could actually say the costs are justified. However, if we look at the costs, we think that the money that goes into the condition could probably better allocate it. Um, we actually think that the cost distribution could be optimized. There are people who do not need a lot of investigations and we think some of them get them and they actually get repeated. Um, and that is one part of our worry. Also, if we look at the impact on patients and the cost associated, there's some self-cost for patients. This is m worse in those with more severe symptoms. And I think some of the healthcare costs should be reallocated to that. And to do so, we think a couple of steps are needed. A simple algorithm, diagnostic aid that would give physicians dealing with these patients, and very many physicians deal with that, uh, to make a more confident diagnosis. So to actually allow them to communicate to the patient, this is IBS, we know what you have, um, and then do a very cost-effective, minimal investigation plan that would save costs. And what is saved there could actually be allocated to care for those with more severe symptoms because these are the ones who are staying home from work, generating societal costs, perhaps having repeat exams because they go to different doctors with the same question, costing more health care. And these are the ones perhaps who deserve to be treated adequately with some of the newer and better drugs that we now have. Well, the diagnosis for IBS, there's a consensus on criteria and diagnostic thresholds. So that me it means it's actually a description which type of symptoms do you need to have, how long do you need to have them, uh, how often a week, and in which combination. And whichever way you turn it, this is a little bit more technical, such an approach. And usually when you see a patient, you're not counting how many days a week is this, you're kind of going by sense of frequency and you don't have to explicitly have it spelled out by the patient. And there is a history through that. When Rome started, Rome 1 was actually designed to make uniform patient groups for clinical trials. But as Rome has evolved, now we're at the fourth iteration, it has come closer to clinical practice. And actually I think the current description of the, of the symptom criteria is very simple. Um, and usable, close to usable in clinical practice. But with it comes also a recommendation to do very limited um, cost-effective examinations in some patient profiles, do a little bit more in others. And if you put that together at the end of the day, for somebody who does not treat GI every day, I'm thinking of general practitioners, 
it is probably still too complex for them to just have it in their mind as a ready toolkit. So it would be great if they had like an app or a, a office uh, desk site, small thing, card that they can look at, and I think this is what they need, a kind of small diagnostic aid. There are ways to incorporate that with some information to the patient as well. So there are things that could serve there and which would facilitate the diagnosis. That would have to come with a kind of instruction and education of the physician to say, if you think it's IBS, it's not enough. You need actually to communicate it, because for the patient with chronic symptoms, if it has a label, it reassures you. Whereas I think in the past there was often a tendency to say, we looked and you have nothing severe. And this is very unrewarding, and I think this is behind the four years and a half diagnostic delay. It's not that these patients were not taken care of, but it was not said, we know what you have. It was more like, they don't find what I have, but I think it's not dangerous. And I think that is not a good way to deal with these patients. This is an early phase, so the, the patient-directed tools have not been made yet, but this is a logical consequence of what we have been doing. And you want to interact and improve the interaction between physician and patients, because that should be the basis for therapeutic choices. One thing is that the physician should be able to know from the patient the level to which he or she is impacted. And this is severity, but severity is not only how bad is the pain, but what does it stop you from doing. And I think there, the physician needs to find that out. There are two ways to do that. Either you do a more elaborate interview. I ask, for instance, always to my patients, does it keep you home from going out, working, are there things you avoid doing, do you have to stop your work uh, professionally, things you do at home, but there's probably ways to capture that in a more easy and more structured way toward general practitioners. That is one thing. Um, a second thing is that the physician should also be aware of what is the agenda of the patient. Is the patient who has perhaps symptoms for two years or half a year before they come, is it a worry? Is it a reassurance, a diagnosis, and does it end there? Or is the patient's agenda, no, I want to get rid of the symptoms, I want to control this because they interfere with my daily life. So that is one part, improving that kind of interaction. A second part is, it is difficult for a physician to say, I, we know IBS very well, this is a diagnosis, and then if the patient asks, so what does it mean? You need to have a kind of conceptual, explicable framework, a way to communicate to the patient how the symptoms then arise if, if you would have done a colonoscopy, not necessary in everybody, far from even, but if the colon is normal, how do you explain that? And that is, has to do with sensitivity and motor function of the colon, perhaps with gut microbiota, and verbally saying this is not easy for every physician who is not doing GI every day, we could actually envision a small visual aid that actually gives a communicable concept for the physician to the patient, so the patient understands, okay, this is how it works. Actually, it's the bowel that does not work very well, or the gut microflora, which is slightly different, causing me symptoms. And sometimes it's an anchor for certain therapies. Some of the therapies that we have will change bowel function. And then you have a very good explanatory model, taking it forward into a treatment plan with the patient. And that is the last thing that also needs to be done. If you propose a treatment as a, as a physician, you need to explain a little bit why you do it. And for some drugs, this is easier than for others. And then explain a little bit what may the patient expect. Are there any side effects? Um, what's the timing of symptom relief? And is the symptom relief different? Because IBS is actually a constellation of symptoms and not every symptom of that constellation will respond in the same timely fashion. For instance, altered stool pattern may respond very rapidly. Some of the pain takes several weeks of treatment before this also starts to respond, and you need to be aware of that. Well, this is a frustrating condition to some extent for physicians with symptoms. And very often, and for a long time until we had some better treatments, difficult to treat. So there's always a level of uncertainty first, um, and there's always been a level of, of difficulty getting resolve of the patient. And I think from the patient's point of view also an expectation, are you sure that nothing was missed? 
And in, there is a back history from the 70s, actually, that it was said this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you need to do a lot of tests. And we've now come to a framework when we say you do need to do very little tests. If you have a typical history, you do a couple of safety checks which are limited. can be a blood sample and a stool sample. In those with diarrhea, we do a little bit more, but it's very limited. And actually where we would do additional measures is to find other diseases that can mimic the symptoms, which is colorectal cancer and inflammatory bowel disease and to a lesser extent celiac disease. These are not prevalent. Um, inflammatory bowel disease is mainly found in a, uh, more easy found um, if there is a family history. Colorectal cancer, there are threshold ages to screen for it. And actually you can use some of these guidelines to decide when you would do the testing. And IBS is a disease that often starts in the 20s, 30s, actually before the age of onset of cancer risk. So this is a large group that doesn't need a colonoscopy. Epidemiology data, for instance, from Belgium, but there's some also in the document from other countries, show that many IBS patients get a colonoscopy. I think this is a waste of resources. The diagnostic yield is going to be very low in somebody below the age and not belonging to the risk groups uh, for IBD. And we could relocate these resources. Colonoscopy is very good as a screening tool if you do it in the right patient group. And at least half of the patients with IBS are below that threshold. So we can save resources there. I think also a lot of imaging is done in times of uncertainty or lack of response to initial treatment. And actually there's no data at all to show that you gain anything um, if there's only a typical IBS-like history doing ultrasounds, let alone CT scans or MRI. The latter two are very, very expensive exams. Um, the CT scan has some radiation exposure. So these could be avoided to save money with a smooth diagnostics. And I think what we save there could be used for better treatments and to take care of the more severe patients. These are the ones who may use or need combined therapies, uh, may require additional non-pharmacological therapies. And I think that is a path that we would like to sign out for the future. This part of the work is not done, but it's actively being pursued because we had meetings on the next steps, diagnostic algorithm, treatment algorithm already during this meeting. Oh, I think um, things have changed dramatically. In the 60s, but this has not completely disappeared, but there was a view that this must be psychosomatic of, or psychopathology. Um, there was actually a view to say this is just people not properly coping with daily life stresses and they have a low tolerance, low resilience um, kind of attitude or mindset and that explains it. And if that is your paradigm, actually the implication would be they don't belong in GI. They should be elsewhere. They should be managed by psychologists. Um, so that is an old stigma, I think, that is still around to some extent. However, in the 50, in the 50 years since then, you can actually see a gradual decrease uh, because of many, many reasons. First of all, good science, which has shown Abnormalities in the periphery, if you do sophisticated analysis, if you go beyond the clinical routine, you actually find abnormalities in many of the patients. It's a heterogeneous condition. This is also what we have learned down the road. Not every patient with IBS is the same. There are some, if you take a biopsy, they have low-grade inflammation that you don't see on the endoscopy. Some of them do not. Some of them have abnormalities of transit, the bowel working either too fast or too slow. Some of them do not, so this is heterogeneous. But we had measurements of GI function, some structural abnormalities beyond routine that are abnormal. And then we have good epidemiology showing the prevalence and the association with some of the psychological comorbidities. They are there. There's a slightly elevated uh, level of anxiety, a higher tendency to be depressed, but this doesn't define the disease. It's in a minority. It's a subgroup that is slightly better than, uh, bigger than in the general population, but it doesn't define it. So this is part of where we have come. Then the Rome Foundation has done a lot to make this an acceptable, 
diagnosable, recognizable disease. I think this is work from the 90s to the last 25 years, actually. Um, that has contributed a lot. And then I think drug development is very important. Some of the most successful drugs that we now are getting available, they don't even get absorbed and certainly do not go to the brain. So certainly the treatment is peripheral. And treatment advances have shown new pathophysiological concepts. For instance, linaclotide works on the GCC receptor. This is a detail, but now data are emerging that perhaps the expression of this receptor is altered in IBS. And so this actually progresses the field. Putting all of this together, I think the view on IBS is very, very different than in the past, but some of the negative attitudes still linger on. A last evolution, I think, is the dietary interest. There is a link between food and IBS. Symptoms are peaking or worsening after a meal, so there is a link. And so many patients think that it's what they eat that causes it. Um, many patients are interested in the diet. There are some who respond to diet. This is a moving field. Not everybody responds, but that is also another aspect. And the last aspect is the microbiome. We now are aware that this is probably a big um, intermediate player in many, many diseases, probably including IBS. The last word has not been said of this, uh, about this, but again, this puts some abnormality in the periphery, not in the brain, and actually, sort of to say, outside of the body. The lumen of the bowel, in a way, is the outside, but, but it's intrinsic to yourself, and that is another part. So I think with all these backgrounds, with the science evolving, looking at gut function, microbiota, the way we can now measure all of this and with new treatments, I think it looks good. And I think the attitude towards IBS will improve. Physicians will probably become more enthusiastic to, to, tra to treat this. And we are going to push it with this report and what follows it. We'll speed up that process.